we'll, we'll stop at this. I live in an apartment in, in uh, Hyderabad city, close to Panjagotta and Somajagod area. Just a stone's throw from the chief minister's residence. I pay like everybody else. Actually, my wife pays. She wants the apartment. Uh, every month, X amount as a maintenance fee. Supposing the elevator is not functioning. Immediately, I'll pick up the phone and say, Bhai, you know, I'm not getting on in years. And my doctor tells me I should not climb up too many stairs. I'm paying the monthly maintenance fee and the elevator is not functioning. That is democracy. Because I understand that Amitabh Bhai, who is taking care of it, has to ensure that the elevator functions and I am paying to make that happen. If it's not happening, I have a problem. That is how democracy really works. When there's a link between your vote, the confidence you bestow on a public manager and the consequences that visit on you directly and your family and your taxes and the benefits you receive or don't receive. We have not built that. We built a, a celebratory structure uh, celebrate, oh great, you know, Samasha, who go and vote, you know, um, somebody gives money, somebody shouts, somebody says a caste hai, somebody says a religion hai, a dharma hai, oh. we all get lost in that. But what it means to me, we have never really revealed to ourselves. Until that happens, our democracy is only very shallow democracy. I don't say it's zero, but it's closer to zero than to hundred. That's the broad sense. Yes, and what I was kind of insinuating was that Look, Singapore didn't become Singapore because of the last three you mentioned. It became Singapore because the first yardstick where PAP really put together, or this Kwan really put together a process to attract talent. I, I agree with you. I am with you. To do the next I am with you. Yeah, and with this, in 70 years, we have created talent. We have created IITs and IMs, but we haven't been able to attract the same talent I agree. back into governance. There's no argument. Our, so, our only issue is. How do you transform our political and governance structures to make that happen through a democratic and free rule rather than a semi-authoritarian rule? That's all. Yes. Good evening, sir. Uh, this is Kashyap. I'm originally from Nellore, uh, Andhra. And uh, the question is about one of the topics that you mentioned at the beginning of the lecture. Uh, I would request you to make a comment on the long-term health care and preventive care in India. So particularly in light of the recent uh, reforms or changes that uh, uh, the central government has done. Uh, I, I have followed and known about your uh, fight for getting the MMR vaccine, you know, that uh, uh, you know, being prevalent and all. Can we envisage a scenario in the near future where uh, we, we move to a Europe model with uh, universal health care? Or, and how do, you, how do we avoid the pitfalls here in the US? We should move to that model. We are not moving towards that model at this point of time. Tragically, we are aping America. I admire America, but not all things. America can afford to commit costly mistakes, but we cannot. You can afford to spend 18, 19% of GDP on health care with outcomes which are pedestrian by, by at least developed country standards. India cannot. We spend 1.1% GDP on public health. Total award 5% or so on healthcare, public, private, public, 80% in private. In that situation, the government using every rupee must use it wisely to get the best outcomes. Today, they are getting pedestrian outcomes with enormous cost. Therefore, this 100 million families and therefore 500 million, half a billion people, the world's largest insurance, it means nothing. It will give an illusion of satisfaction to a significant number of people because somebody is putting the bill. I guarantee you, it will not improve the health uh, healthcare outcomes by any objective indicator. There are objective indicators like disability adjusted life years and mortality, morbidity, longevity, you know, and a hundred other things. That's not a problem. Uh, therefore, it's the wrong model. We must move towards roughly British European model of first a GP system, publicly funded but with choice to people, acting as a referral gatekeeper apart from providing the primary care services. Then you look at all these models, I am all in favor. But tertiary care, a lot of money with tertiary hospitals, high cost, low impact, ignoring the other things is about the worst possible model because CMC Vellore is possibly the best hospital in India. No? Ethical, principal, high quality, you know, Christian missionaries of deep devotion. I mean, the, the moral fervor they feel, you have to see it to believe it. 
But what is the survival rate? 80% die in the hospital. That's the nature of apex tertiary care. That's not where the most money should go initially. I'm not saying it should not be there. I celebrate the fact that India can now do knee replacements, uh, cardiothoracic surgeries, kidney replay, kidney transplantations. We need that too because India cannot afford not to have those things. But doing more of that is not the answer. We have to, and we prepared, if you're interested, looks at the prepared, a very viable model at a very low cost, under 1% GDP additional expenditure by the government, but judiciously spent with public-private partnership and competition, we can radically improve the outcomes. Who is listening? I'm here so that some people who have the depth and understanding will focus on these things and shout from rooftops. If not today, tomorrow that becomes the agenda of the nation. Otherwise, frankly, you're wasting your time, I'm wasting my time. Namaskar JPG. I don't have any questions, but you know. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you for coming here and thank you so much for your time. My name is Chendu Siramdas. I'm, in fact, I'm running for city council. Oh, great. For, you know, uh, from District 1 in Fremont. So I belong to Telangana State. Uh, I'm from Karimnagar District. I have been I was living trained in, in that district. I'm very fond of Karimnagar. <laughs> thank you. So I have been living in Fremont for the last 20 years. I have two sons, grown up children, who are doing their engineering. So I do not have any questions, but we do love your speeches and uh, you know your principles and ideas for the country and for the state. Especially my husband and I really truly love your speech. So I truly appreciate if you can give me some advices. You know, I truly appreciate it. Thank I, you. I only hope that you'll get the kind of support that you deserve. I'm glad that people like you are engaging yourselves in the, in the public affairs in this country because one of my complaints about our Indian community in the U.S. is that we are too insular. While we are doing whatever is honorable as citizens, we Indians are going to be law-abiding, contributors to wealth creation, very disciplined and uh, very peaceful, all these are good. But we also need to be engaged deeply in the American community, not American Indian community. Or Indian American, is it American Indian? Indian American, I'm confused. Indian, Indian American. No, <laughs> American Indian is that the other ones. Uh, I'm glad that people like you are, 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 are addressing that. And I, I encourage each of you to play a creative role in the community here in the US. Well, I very much want you to also play a creative role back home in India. Uh, unless you do that, A, we are not fulfilling our obligations as citizens, and B, our influence, our credibility will not rise beyond a point. So I, I encourage you and I, I congratulate you, applaud you for that. And I hope, among others, certainly there's nothing wrong in, in helping our own. I'm not being parochial. I hope the Indian community will stand by you and uh, help you. And I hope the Andhra Telangana issues will not emerge here. <laughs> <laughs> My question is uh, regarding governance. So, uh, I think like uh, a good government is uh, the one which is like not visible. I mean, uh, things happen like smoothly. Uh, what I feel in India, uh, I think the amount of governance is actually increasing day to day. I mean, uh, you can take the case of Aadhaar or like, I don't know, uh, demonetization. So, do you think the amount of governance is actually increasing in day to day lives of people? Uh, if it is so, is it like good for the country or bad for the country? There are several layers to your question. Uh, I don't want to go into too many technical issues. For instance, tax GDP ratio in India is still relatively low compared to developing country standards. But without going into that, you are broadly right that there is too much of visibility of government and too little effectiveness in outcome. Too much of attraction for political or, or even bureaucratic power and too little focus on service delivery. Too much of arrogance and too little humility. Uh, in that sense, in, and of course, overall indicators, we have lost a sense of what the government is about. I've been always arguing, you should not bother about the right, left, communist, socialist, uh, public sector, private, this is all old hat. What we should focus on is what is the role of the government? Why are we creating this artificial construct called government to sit over our heads? Because there is a purpose that we individually cannot deliver which is still necessary to be served and therefore the collective entity is created 
we make it accountable and we we fund that government short of all the rpas that is the essence of it because collective needs must be met by some entity and individuals however well well they they are however able they are they cannot meet the collective needs beyond a point and if we focus on what the government needs to do for our well being as human beings and then hold the government to account i think will be more productive and therefore i completely endorse that kind of approach yes so um what is the state of uh, the lok sabha party today uh, and let me ask a second question too so if you could go back in time and redo uh, how the foray into electoral politics was done would you do it differently this time it's a great question if i knew as much today as i then as as today i probably would have thought longer and harder but that's the luxury we do not have supposing we did not make this foreign electoral politics even i who made it a lifetime's mission to understand india and try and see what we can do to improve the public governance would not have had the depth and clarity about the nature of a politics as i have now so somebody has to be the bakra there is no choice if somebody else was a bakra and gave us that wisdom i would have been very happy and there's a reason why we entered into electoral politics i made it clear a thousand times i've always resisted this many people from the beginning advised me why don't you join electoral fray i said look we are not really cut out for that it's a simple statement of fact electoral competition anywhere in the world is a very complex and messy process and that's not something where we are good at because now when you reconcile conflicting emotions and interests you have to be somewhat economical with truth if you are very outspoken and utterly truthful disregarding the consequences in the short term there's a guaranteed recipe for electoral failure apart from other things apart from money power in india and caste other things etc but nevertheless i made a conscious decision i don't regret it because the decision had to be made in a historic sense because i i, I assessed at that time that maybe about 10 15% of india urban the educated the youthful india is now willing to seek change not by speech but by action by a simple act of voting consistently for real change i knew that 10 15% vote in our electoral system means nothing in terms of electoral outcome legislators you get zero vote with 10% vote zero seat with 10% vote but doesn't matter a 10% vote i know for sure is enough of a lever for a group like ours to transform india that's enough for me but the truth is the 10% is not there about 8 to 10% in hyderabad we got consistent but even that after some time would decline because once people feel that the vote is not translated into seats people don't always stand by you and rural india rural andhra pradesh rural telangana rural karnataka elsewhere we got much less and it's getting worse sadly for the country except for delhi because of the situation i mentioned hyper capita income and the fact that that vote is translated into a tangible outcome for delhi city you don't have to worry about some other area 2013 lok satta contested in uh, bangalore city in the assembly election we got some 2.5 3% vote rural plus urban in karnataka wherever we contested urban bangalore probably we got 4 5% we got between 6000 and 12000 votes per assembly constituency 2018 aap contested in bangalore city and elsewhere they got 1000 votes on average aap is actually in many ways a, a more electable party because they are aggressive and they have a bigger brand image today for whatever reason it's not because of aap's failure the situation has become more hostile by using electoral politics as a means of fundamental change in india for the time being at least in some parts of india like karnataka andhra pradesh telangana etc it is that reason that made us decide that we should not waste our energies knowing full well that we will not get that 5 10% vote and we will not have any tangible outcome to trans- to help transform india therefore conserve energy and do something else 
to achieve the goal. There's absolutely no other. It's a very open, honest admission, then and now. I don't regret it. But had I known as much then as I know today, maybe I would have thought much, much hard. I would have, I would have waited for somebody else to become a Bakra. Hello, uh, my name is Govardhan Mucharla. Uh, I'm from a very rural place uh, in Karimnagar, uh, Telangana. Uh, forgive my English speaking skills. Uh, I hail from a very, you can say, small government school where my English teacher. We all come to, from that. Don't learn English, English from it. You okay. know, Churchill said, when you were, Churchill was told when he was a young man and he was a very uh, halting public speaker, lacking in confidence, when senior politician said, Winston, don't worry. Think everybody in front of you is a bloody fool and just speak. <laughs> <laughs> so don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, sir. So, uh, and I run uh, an organization, uh, oh, but currently I work for Google uh, as a software engineer. And uh, I run an organization called Sadisha Foundation, uh, which conducts an exam in mathematics for class 10 students of government school, uh, schools. And uh, we, uh, I mean, we offered six, uh, well, a few people for their plus two education, including hostel. Uh, and yeah, last year, there were 10,000 plus people attended uh, the exam. And yeah, so, uh, well, my question is, um, yeah, so my question is, so there, I see actually orders of India as two, uh, two different clusters. So one is the people who enable government by paying taxes, uh, well, majority, uh, like 90% of the income, I guess, like comes from uh, some 10% of the population, I guess, and next comes to the rural mostly, so who, kind of outnumber the people who pay the taxes and finally they decide actually who gets elected, right? I think there is a disconnect, a big disconnect between that. So, uh, I think... I spoke voting. like Mitt Romney. <laughs> you remember the 47% people don't pay taxes kind of thing. <laughs> okay. so, uh, Some of you may not be familiar because you are too young.